Good morning. It is Monday morning of Holy Week, and uh, this is the this is the time that we've set aside in the church to move us intentionally to, through the passion of Christ, the crucifixion, his death, his burial, and of course his resurrection. And uh, I thought in preparation for this, it might be beneficial for us to kind of walk through Jesus' week with him. So every day this week, my intention is to shoot out just a little video to kind of say, this is where Jesus was on Monday of Holy Week and Tuesday and Wednesday and, and kind of track his movement and what was happening and everything that led up to the cross. And so I wanted to begin this morning um, by talking about Jesus going into the temple. Um, now, he might have done this on a Monday or a Tuesday. Um, as we read the different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have an account of Jesus going into the temple. Um, we're not quite certain. Was it on a Monday or was it on a Tuesday? For the sake of these little bits of teaching, we're going to we're going to assume it's on Monday. It could have been on Tuesday. It doesn't matter. Um, but it gives us at least a direction here. And so, uh, so we celebrated Jesus' triumphal entry yesterday. The palm branches, the hosannas, and um, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. He has set his eyes, Isaiah says, as flint. And, um, and so the cross is before him. He knows why he's come to Jerusalem. And, and so as we work through this week, we've got to remember, Jesus is doing this with the intention of the cross. Imagine if you knew that you were dying, and not just that you were dying, but imagine that you knew when. Imagine you even knew the circumstances, and now you're days away from that event. What would you do? How would you behave? What things would you say? Wow. But I think about this in terms of Jesus. He's days out. And there is an intentional aspect to everything that Jesus does. And there is an urgency to every movement of Jesus during this time. And so um, it's not an accident that he goes into the temple. Jesus didn't go into the temple and just lose his cool. Don't, don't do that to the text. Don't make it sound like... Jesus went in, saw what was going on, and blew his top. There is something intentional that's occurring in Jesus. And um, we want to look at that. The first thing we've got to see as, um, as we look at what Jesus um, is doing and what he's trying to say as he goes into the temple is um, it, the first thing we need to understand is what the temple was meant to be. Um, what is the temple supposed to be? And there's a lot of things. I want to highlight two things. Number one, um, the temple was that place where heaven and earth intersected. Actually, it wasn't just where heaven and earth intersected. It was the place where heaven and earth were held together. Um, this realm of God and this realm of humanity be, overlapped and, and found cohesion in the temple, in particular in the Holy of Holies. This is where God's habitation took on an earthly habitation in that Holy of Holies. Now, traditionally or, or in antiquity, that place held the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in Jesus' day, that Ark had long since been lost, um, sadly. Um, but, but in the Old Testament, from the Exodus and, and all throughout Israel's history, that Ark of the Covenant, um, God's covenant, was there in the holy place. This is, um, this, is the, this is the symbol of God's promise to his people. Of course, the tablets of stone, Aaron's budding staff, um, an omar of manna, um, these symbols of God's relationship with Israel. Um, but the lid itself that covered the ark, um, the, the angel's wings that would overshadow, and it was gold plated, and gold leaf maybe, I don't know, um, but it was overlaid in gold and, and these cherubim had their wings extending over. That cover was called the hilasterion. 
I know that's not an English word for us, um, but the New Testament helps us in understanding that word. Um, in Hebrews, actually, that word is translated as mercy seat. It is the place where the glory of God over this lid, it is that, that physical place where the glory of God came and rested. Um, it is where the Shekinah glory of God, the, the ineffable, the unexplainable glory of God actually manifested. But Hebrews calls it, the book of Hebrews calls it the mercy seat. And I kind of like that. I, I really like that. Um, this place where heaven and earth is held together is held together on two principles, judgment and mercy. <laughs> um, the idea of judgment and mercy going together is that you can't separate them. If mercy is given, it's because judgment has been rendered. You understand? Um, if, I, if I extend mercy to you for something, um, something you've done, it's because there was a judgment rendered that what you did was wrong, or, or vice versa. So this idea of a mercy seat, it's not just mercy. Where there is mercy, there is judgment. And these two things hold together heaven and earth. There is right judgment and there is, there is profound mercy that flows from the presence of God, the seat of God's presence. And this is how heaven and earth are held together. It's held together on good judgment and profound mercy. This is where God dwells. This is who God is. Um, what does that mean for the Christian? It means that when judgment is rendered, mercy must be proffered. We dare not, as Christians, just render judgment and not also offer mercy or extend mercy because that's the character of God. This is how heaven and earth are bound together. This is what the temple was. It was the place where um, mercy was given, where judgment was rendered, but those things held heaven and earth together. So this is the first thing that um, the temple did. Keep this in your mind before we get to Jesus cleansing the temple. The second thing that the temple did was that it became an extension of judgment and mercy not just for the people of Israel, not for just for God's chosen, but for the whole world. This is going to move us into some of the things that Jesus said. I want to read to you from Isaiah 57. Um, Isaiah 57. Jesus is going to quote some of these verses, or a portion of this verse, um, a portion of the verses that I'm going to read in, in his cleansing. But this gives us our second purpose for the temple. I'm sorry, Isaiah 56. I knew that didn't look right. Isaiah 56, um, beginning with verse 6, but all the way through 8. And, and listen for verse 8. But here's what it says. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds, my, uh, holds fast my covenant. Uh, what was the, co the covenant was to God's people, but now he's, he's inviting the foreigners into that covenant. He says, these I will bring to my holy mountain, to Zion, and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. The, again, this is the foreigner. These are the Gentiles, not the Jews. And he says, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, for all nations. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those who already, who, besides those already gathered. Okay, so here's the second purpose of the temple. Remember, it is to hold heaven and earth together on these dual concepts of mercy and judgment, but this mercy and this judgment are extended to all people. Uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. I will gather those, not just those that I've already gathered, but I'm going to gather the others, those who are on the outside. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to make it accessible to all people. It shall be called a house of prayer. Prayer is conversation with God. I'm going to make my house a place where 
those on the outside have access to God, this place where heaven and earth are held together. And, and, and no matter where you come from, no matter how you come, if you will come into this place and you will, you will, you will not profane my Sabbath and you will, um, you will become part of my covenant relationship, I will extend the same mercy that is a result of judgment to you so that you will have access to God. You, personally, all people. It's pretty profound. It is mercy for all people. So the dual purpose of the temple is a place where heaven and earth are held together through mercy and judgment, and that this mercy and judgment is, an extend, is extended to all people. Okay, so that's what the temple is supposed to be. Now, when Jesus comes into the temple, in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he quotes Isaiah. He quotes that verse. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Um, for all people is this concept behind it. So the question is, is what has this temple become? What is it supposed to be? We dealt with that. But what has it become? He says at one point in Matthew's Gospel, he says it has become a den of of robbers a den of robbers now let's talk about that for a second because he's quoting another verse it's actually jeremiah jeremiah 7 11. i remember it because of the gas station 7 11. Um, so he's quoting jeremiah 7 11. Um, have you not heard my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations that's isaiah 56 but then he says but you have made it a den of robbers and here it is in Jeremiah 7, 11. Um, here's what he says. Uh, let me find it. Uh, let me back up, give it some context. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name? and say, here we are delivered, only to go on doing all of those abominations. You see what's going on? He's saying, are you going to go out and do all of these horrible things and come into my house and, and say, we are delivered, and then leave my house and go and do it again? He's getting frustrated. And so here's where he says in verse 11, has this house, which is called by not my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Who God has seen it. Now Jesus is coming, and he's saying, I have seen it. He's speaking with the voice of the Lord. I have seen it. My house has become a den of robbers. And, and, and I thought this always had to do with the money changers' tables and the thieving, the thievery that occurred. And there's, there is an aspect to that. Do not... Do not make uh, this a place that, that robs from other people. But that's not what a den of robbers is. See, a den of robbers is actually where the robbers go once they have stealed. The den is a place of safety. That's where they hoard their treasures. That's where they, uh, they, uh, they find their safety and their refuge. They go out from their den. They do their stealing. They do their debauchery. And then they come into their den and they declare safety in that place. And this is part of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you have made my, my father's house a place of refuge for the wicked. Not the wicked who are being redeemed, not the wicked who are receiving mercy, but the wicked who would justify their own behavior. He's talking to the church leaders. You have made it a place of safety for your own wickedness. Um, earlier in the same passage, uh, in Jeremiah, he says, do not trust these deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. He's singing a song. Do not trust these deceptive words. Do not come into my house and just say, well, this is the temple of the Lord and think that you have safety uh, because, and, and not change any of your life because what you're doing is you're making it a den of robbers. You're trying to make it a safe place to still be wicked. And let me tell you, the temple of God is a safe place for the wicked, 
but it is not a safe place to be wicked. <laughs> That's mercy and judgment. Judgment says there is wickedness. Mercy says, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to bring heaven to earth and I'm going to hold it together by giving you mercy so that you can act heavenly on earth. But you make it a den of robbers when you bring your wickedness in and say, this is the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, and then you continue doing whatever it is you've been doing. Huh. You make it a den of robbers and in the process, you keep people. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations. In the process, you keep all nations from coming into that place. You're profaning the name of the Lord. Remember, this temple is a place where God's name is inhabited. Um, and, and you profane the name of the Lord because you say, it's my place of safety, but it's not your place of mercy. This is to the church leaders. This is what Jesus is doing. He's not cleansing the temple in the sense that the temple itself needs cleansed. He's cleansing the corrupt nature of that that, occur, that had crept into the temple through the people who are supposed to have kept it pure. You have... You have made it a safe house for oppressor, oppressors rather than a safe house of mercy and justice for all nations, all people, especially the oppressed. This is what Jesus was doing. He was disrupting that system. And in his disrupting that system, he was actually foretelling the destruction of that system later. He says it's all going to crumble. It's all going to fall apart. And so for whatever length of time, he turns over the money changers' tables, he drives the oxen and the sheep out with the sacrifices that were being offered, and I'm sure they put all the pieces back together as quickly as they, poss as they possibly could. Um, but for a short amount of time, the whole system was disrupted. The sacrifices stopped. Um, everything came to a screeching halt. Was it an hour? Was it two? Was it three? I, we don't know. But that disruption became a foreshadowing of the destruction of that entire system because the system had been, become corrupt. And Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to disrupt that system. My death, my burial, my resurrection, there's judgment rendered. I will take that judgment upon myself. There's mercy. I'm giving it to all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so what the temple was supposed to do, Jesus said, you know what? I'll do that. I'm going to offer that to all people. Here's a thought I want you to carry with you all throughout this week. It comes from C.S. Lewis. Um, here's what he says. Nothing that has not died will be resurrected. It's part of what Jesus was doing. He was bringing this temple system to a death of sorts so that it could be resurrected in Christ. The church, the true church, he was bringing it to death. But this applies to us as well. This is part of the, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ is that nothing that has not died will be resurrected. We cannot speak of resurrection and hope and joy and these things in our life if we have not died. If the old systems, the perverted systems, the wicked systems in our life have not died. We need Jesus to come in again and kind of disrupt the system as a way of destroying what we have built. <laughs> There's two realities, it seems. I just scratched these notes this morning. We are either ready for death or we are good for nothing but death. This idea of ready for death, if we are ready for death, if we are ready to allow Jesus to put to death in us those old systems to throw over the tables of our life, if we're ready for that, then we will find resurrection. The other option is we're either ready for death or we're good for nothing but dying. And that's an eternal death. I fear some of us have spent so long in these systems that we have ceased to recognize them 
as profanity before God. This is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord. We sing our songs like that. One nation under God. One nation under God. One nation under God. We sing our songs and we expect that that is our refuge. The songs that we sing. It's not. I think sometimes we need our systems disrupted. We need Jesus to turn over the tables, to bring it to a point of death so that it can be resurrected. But if we're not ready for it, the only thing we will be good for is death itself. Hmm. This is the beginning of Holy Week. This was one of Jesus' first messages. I'm going to invite you to read these passages. Go to Isaiah 56. Read those verses. Go to Jeremiah 7. Begin with verse 1. Read those verses. Go to um, the cleansing in the temple. You can find it in all four Gospels. And listen to what Jesus wants to say, because I believe there is a disruption, a sacred disruption that's for our lives for today.